this is definitely the people's house. This belongs to the state of Colorado, and everyone should be proud of this building. The work of the people is done here. When the legislators pass law, they want to better the lives of the people of Colorado, and that's why this is called the people's house. They own the house, it belongs to them, but what goes on in here affects them greatly. We are here privileged to serve in something that uh, we have inherited from those who came before us and a legacy that we are required to leave for those who come after us. It belongs to the people uh, of Colorado and frankly of this country. It really is the people's house. 65 members coming from all across the state. This is where the action happens and this is where the, the voice of the people is heard most fervently and most often. You know, we're the representatives of the people. Uh, that's our titles are representatives. Uh, and so each representative represents about 77,000 people. And here we debate the issues that impact everyone across the state. It is really where the people and the government interact and make decisions of what's going to impact our state. When Speaker McNulty became Speaker, the one thing he said to me was, before I leave office, I want the crooked radiator fixed. There's a radiator up in the, that part of the gallery that sat crooked. And he said, can we fix it? And I told him, I said, I have tried for three years to get that straightened. I've been told that there are problems, it's the piping, it would cost a lot of money, they'd have to get into the wall. And he said, well, let's try again. And he said, and you know, while you're at it, why don't you see what's behind the acoustical tiles? And I said, well, that's gonna cost a whole heck of a lot more money than straightening a radiator. And I said, and if there's asbestos, it's gonna be even worse. And he said, well, have it tested. So that's the first thing I did was I called Capitol Complex and they tested and there was no asbestos. So he said, let's take some off and see what's behind it. Well, that didn't happen right away, and then Speaker Ferrandino then took over. He talked to Speaker Ferrandino about continuing the project. So we then we did have the crew come in, and they started taking tiles off. And they took the first ones off in the Senate, and of course they, were, they, they discovered the stenciling immediately. The original wall was behind those tiles. Who knew? We did not know that. And then they came over here, and took some tiles off, and all they found was gray paint. I was very upset. I got, I started crying, and I said, you just keep taking tiles off in different places until you find stenciling, and this is where we are today. 10 years ago, we had a project, an emergency project in the governor's office, where the ceiling tile was cracking one of his chandeliers, and when we went up to look at, uh, to find out what the, the issues were, what the problem was, uh, that was my first kind of uh, exposure to some of the damage that had been done here. And we saw some of the ornate cornice work and the, the, the freezes, and they'd actually taken hammers and broken holes in them for duct work, for conduit. And uh, that, that was kind of my first awareness or aha moment of what, what's been covered up here in the past. The second point kind of took place during the life safety project when we were doing Mr. Brown's attic up in the, uh, the third floor of the Capitol. And we started looking for historic photographs of the chambers and what had been here in the past. And that's when we were first brought aware of what could be under the acoustic ceiling tile. And the acoustic tile was installed in 1956 for acoustic reasons. And not only did they do the walls, but they did the ceilings. They covered up the skylight, they covered up the, the coffer, uh, all in the name of progress, I guess you could say. And now we're going back and uh, restoring it to its 1905 uh, conditions. Is, is, that's the intent at this point. Once the stencing was uncovered, I mean, that was uh, kind of a dramatic moment for both in the House and the Senate. 
and uh, there was quite a rush of people coming over from around the Capitol to look at it. And the, the state you see right now is from, dated back to 1905. We have, a, we have photographs of both the House and the Senate, and that's our period of historic significance from 1905 to approximately 1956 or 1960 when it was covered up. The color of the stenciling is uh, much darker now than it was when it was first installed. Uh, due to 50, 60 years of cigar smoke, cigarette smoke, and actually the gas lamps that were used to light the Capitol the first uh, 10 years it was, uh, it was open. And it's really a work in progress. As we've uh, uncovered things, we thought the stenciling you see now was the original stenciling. We now know it is not the original stenciling. We found uh, 10 more patterns in the Senate and six more patterns in the house. And at this point, we're going to document what they are, but we're not going to expose them. And uh, uh, at one time we talked about painting over the stenciling on the lower level and then putting fresh stencils on top of that. At this point, we're looking at uh, conserving the stenciling and repairing them and keeping as much of the original color and the original stencils as possible. The state's approach to the restoration of the stencils that we found is uh, appropriate for the space due to the fact that the stencils that are on each panel date from 1905 and were visible until approximately the mid-1950s. So 50 years of history of a hundred plus year old capital makes them the more significant of our two choices. The images that we found with the infrared camera we can't actually date. We don't have any photographs or any uh, historical evidence for when they appeared on the walls. They could have appeared and been there for two days before they were painted over by the stencils that we see now, or they could have been there for 10 years and we just are not certain. Um, what I observed through the original stencil work is how the artists or artists originally did the work. And what I've seen they done is taken a general stencil that is the one of three colors and they had a cutout, they applied it with a brush, the paint, and then from there they would go in by hand and bring out the highlights and the lowlights on top of each general stencil color. What I'm doing is duplicating exactly what they did. Um, we had some residue and some damage from the acoustic tiles that were attached over it. So I'm just going over and in painting with a small brush matching those colors and bringing it back to the original appearance. I'm not altering or changing anything of the original artwork, just bringing it back to the colors that we are seeing right now and bringing them sprucing it up and bringing it back to life. I had gone over and cleaned the stencil. It wasn't very dirty, so it's all in good shape. Um, from there, I mix a palette of uh, all, pretty much all the colors in the, in the spectrum and go through and match section by section, because it varies, um, to the color that I see. And, and my goal is so that as anyone comes up, they won't, can't tell anywhere where there was damage or a missing element. I go in and match exactly until I get it right and go over and go over and make sure that everything is smoothed right into the whole stencil work. Um, the colors, when I get a palette, it's kind of hard to explain. It just comes natural to me. You know, I, I grab a little brown, I grab a little ochre, and it just, my hand just seems to go through the palette. But um, I can tell when I'm going something as odd as a, a, a hue is a little too, um, too deep. You throw in something odd like an orange, and it, it just brings things back and brightens things up. But all in all, it is going through and making it so 
the human eye can't tell exactly where that missing element was or where that damage was. I think if the original painters were still here and could see me doing this, they would be pretty happy because I'm not changing anything. I'm, I'm bringing back the hand that they put on there. There's no changing of the, the tones, the definition, everything is the same. They wouldn't see any difference. They'd come in and say, oh, it looks like the first time we did it, which is great, so I'm happy for that. My family started in stained glass in about the early 1700s in Liverpool, England. Then they emigrated through Nova Scotia in about 1860. And then my great-grandfather ended up in Denver in about 1868. And he did stained glass, but there wasn't a whole lot to do since Denver wasn't quite really a city yet. I don't think most of the tents that were here had stained glass in them, so. And then I picked up the business because I started when I was seven. So I've been doing it for probably 60 years now. The process, with the exception of electric solder irons, hasn't changed. They still extrude lead the same way. They still make the glass the same way. I still put them together the same way and the lead that I have in my studio now is made by the same company that made the lead for my grandfather back in the 1890s. So uh, pretty much nothing has changed. It's still labor intensive and it still requires a lot of skill to do a good job. Throughout the capital, I've just been cleaning them and making sure that they're steady. They probably would have lasted another 25 years without anything done to them, but now they'll last I predict 150 years before anything needs to be done to them. In the House and Senate chambers, there was uh, acoustic tile that had been glued to the wall and our mission was to remove that and go back to a historic look that's based on photographs that we have from 1905. So the process was we took the tiles and simply pulled them off. And what was left behind was uh, the glue dollops that attached those to the wall. And we were able to run a hat channel on the wall to space the new material that we were gonna apply, which is uh, acoustic plaster material that is more of a similar look to the original plaster rather than the uh, ugly tiles that we removed and so uh, that plaster was applied to the walls on the furring hat channel and uh, that surface was then color matched to what the original color was and then hand stenciled and painted back to have that um, historic look. The reason that there's a, a little bit of a difference between the gallery level and the floor level in the chambers is that um, we were able to actually salvage the original paintwork on the um, floor level and basically do a touch up covering over the original brush strokes that we could see because the walls were less damaged than on the gallery and we were able to compensate for uh, the acoustic loss that we may have had by removing an acoustic surface from the lower level. Uh, we were able to compensate with uh, the greater technology in, in speaker and audio equipment. Also one of the more interesting elements is where there are were uh, light bulbs that surround both the top of the chamber and the areas between the gallery and floor. And those light bulbs are no longer functional because of uh, efficiency, as well as uh, heat production and for safety. So what's behind the light bulbs 
is actually a, a gilded rosette, which we think probably was intended as also a reflector. So the gilded surface would help reflect the really low wattage of those uh, old light bulbs. As we've been working in the restored chambers this year, uh, I've been showing them off to everybody that I have a chance to. Uh, when we were getting ready for the session and uh, uh, doing, our, doing our practice runs at working on the floor, virtually any tourist that was coming through the lobby that I could get to, I was bringing into the, into the chamber and saying, you have to come in and experience this. And I had a, a, a high school kid out of a group of, of students ask me, how do we justify the expense of the millions of dollars when there are so many competing needs? And that is the typical challenge of being a legislator, is a finite amount of dollars and an infinite amount of requests. And I, and I looked at him and I thought about it for a minute and I said, you know, this place is not just an office building. It's not just a place we work. It's not just a, a, a part of our history. What it is, it's a symbol of the liberty and the freedom and the sacrifice of living in a nation that's unlike any place else on the planet or any other time in history. And Colorado's capital encapsulates all that. And if we don't find a commitment to preserve that, we're going to lose it. That's what this place represents. It's costly and it's worth every penny. The Capitol's not quite like any other building. Um, the value of restoration is that we're really trying to fully honor the history of the building. Uh, we don't have a lot of spaces uh, that really capture history uh, quite as strongly as I think the Capitol does for the state of Colorado. So while you could do some shortcuts and you could simply just fix what is broken, in order to really honor the place of the Capitol in Colorado's history and what it means to the people of the state, you really need to focus on restoring it as much as possible to the original design, the original feel, the original materials, uh, so that we can keep that living history for future generations. It's my hope that the future legislators will do what the members of the 68th, 69th, and 70th General Assemblies have done. They've really cared about the restoration of not only the Senate, but of the entire building. And so I hope that they have the foresight to go ahead and say, this is still important. We still want to continue working on the Capitol building. The records we have indicate in 1956, they covered the coffer up uh, for acoustic reasons. That's the same time they did the ceiling and the walls. And I guess at the time they thought they were doing the right thing. They did help preserve it. They didn't destroy it completely. But since it was covered up uh, over the years, additional damage has been done with fire sprinklers being added to it, uh, alarm systems, uh, structural supports, and the intent now is to go back to the original 1903 look, uh, opening up the coffer and exposing the, uh, the stenciling.
main approach when we when we originally talked to Lance, who's the head architect here, you know, he he wanted no no more damage that's already been done. And obviously you can't really blend things without you have to touch some of the components around what, what we're working on. But uh, if we keep that to a minimal and we're able to blend that damage, that's that's the approach. There's there's a bit of a judgment call involved and it kind of ties back into what your experience and technique is. There are some spots where they came through here with an axe and they literally chopped holes with an axe in these walls and we were able to repair that using hammer and dolly body work. Uh, other places they used a torch and they cut out large chunks and they're just gone forever. So there we've got to figure out what was in place and uh, replicate that part and install it. So it's, it's, a, it's a blend. There's a, there's a point where the damage is too, too far for us to bring it back and we have to make new parts and stick them in. Wherever we can save the original, we do. Everything that they did, they did the best they could by hand at the time, and uh, we're matching our pieces to handmade parts. So you can't just have a bunch of parts cranked out in the factory and expect them to fit. They have to be individually fitted on site. The, the difficult part is the painting, and the, they used to temper paint originally, which is a water-based paint. So we can't even wash it to clean it up because every time water hits it, it just runs. So the intent now is to document everything that's there to preserve it for, for the record and then basically wash it off and go back and recreate the stenciling again uh, on, 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 with new paint, uh, not water-based, so it'll last uh, much longer in the future. I mean, I guess the only thing I'd like to add is that, you know, we're not 100% sure we're doing the right thing. And I'm hoping in 50 to 100 years that they'll say that, yes, we did the right thing preserving it. Uh, I mean, and I know in the past they thought they were doing the right thing. We feel we're doing the right thing as well. And I guess time will be the judge. Just like the third floor galleries, on the ceilings we basically just chiseled the acoustic tiles off and we were able to, to leave the glue behind because we found that in chiseling the glue off, it would damage the original plaster surface more than necessary. So we were able to lay a furring hat channel on those surfaces and create a small relief where the hand-finished plaster surface would be about an inch further off of that uh, original plaster surface but then have that same texture and look of the original plaster. From there, just the same as the gallery, we applied the hand stenciling, highlight, and shadow paint.
in removing the plaster ceiling. Then we uncovered uh, all the damaged plaster work. Much of that plaster was damaged and missing. The plaster had to be replicated and reproduced and reaffixed to the original surfaces. Some of this was done by uh, remolding based off of original pieces and some was actually hand sculpted in, in place to disturb the historic fabric as little as possible. It was necessary to restore the chandeliers because they had been in some state of disrepair over the years. Uh, there had been some rework done to them when the ceilings were lowered in the house in the Senate chambers maybe 50 years ago or so. And the whole top two sections or three sections of each of those chandeliers had been removed. Uh, those chandeliers were originally gas and electric combination because the building had gas before it had electric. Uh, for the first couple of decades that those fixtures hung here, uh, they relied on gas when the electric would, would go out. Today we have other solutions for providing more light in these spaces. So the process of restoring the chandeliers uh, starts with obviously taking them down and disassembling them. There's uh, with all the new parts that we had to make, the castings and the spinnings and the tubing and the extrusions, the canopy, etc., there's over 3,000 parts on, on the chandelier. Weighs a little over 1,700 pounds. So each part had to be, uh, the original finish had to be taken down to bare metal. Uh, those uh, parts had been polished uh, a lot, and so there was a lot of residue from polishing compound and all the casting grooves and things, all that had to be cleaned out. Once the bare metal had been exposed, the brass is then polished to a, to a mirror-like finish, and then it is coated with Incrilac, which is an architecturally specified lacquer. Uh, with the, uh, It's an acrylic lacquer, uh, perfectly clear like water, and it has a UV inhibitor. Uh, why is that good? It's good because once these fixtures are completely restored, uh, they will never tarnish, not in our lifetimes. This is one of those things we can be proud of that was Democrats and Republicans coming together to do this. And actually more than most people think, Democrats and Republicans do come down here uh, and work together on a lot of issues. Uh, but this is one that we all can be proud of. All 5.2 million of Colorado, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, unaffiliated, uh, this is your chamber and this is your capital. And so when it came to actually prioritizing the funding for this and working together to, to figure out how we're gonna get this done, leadership on the Democratic side and the Republican side work together. This started actually under Speaker McNulty, who is a Republican speaker, and continuing under my leadership as Speaker of the House under Democratic control. Um, this is not a partisan issue. This is an issue for all of Colorado. Well, as nonpartisan staff, I've worked in the building for many years, and I feel like the building is for everyone. It's not a partisan issue at all to restore this building to the way it originally was, and I think that Restoration is something that brings everyone together, whether you work in the building, you're a visitor, or whether you're from Colorado, you're just visiting the state. And I think it's a really great focus for everyone to be able to be part of, regardless of party affiliation. And even though the Capitol can be a very political place, I think that the restoration is just something that transcends that and is available for everyone to enjoy. I view the restoration of the Capitol as a bipartisan issue. This is one where Republicans and Democrats have come together to make it happen. We haven't fought about it. Um, we haven't picked sides. We've come together to make this happen, not for us as Republicans or not for them as Democrats, but for all of us as Coloradans. And I think that shows, uh, A, how proud we are of our state, B, how much we recognize the need to remember our history, and finally, that we care about our future. Restoration is not a partisan issue. Speaker McNulty is a Republican. Speaker Ferrandino 
is a Democrat. Speaker Hollinghorst is a Democrat. They all feel restoring this building, restoring especially this chamber, but then restoring the building is important for the people of Colorado. I mean, this is the people's house and they should be proud of it. They shouldn't come into a crumbling building. We have repaired a lot of things over the years, but repairing doesn't make it beautiful. Repairing just fixes cracks and broken things. Restoring it brings it back to the grandeur that it should be, that it had in the beginning. I think maybe it might encourage members to look at the beauty of this building and realize what their job really is, um, have a little bit better respect for the institution, respect for the building. It's hard to respect a building when it's in disrepair, when it's beautiful like this. I think it makes you think a little bit more about what you're doing here.